In this video, we will examine the factors that impact long-term survival and outcomes for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, which were previously called carcinoids. To start with, we need to know the basics as to what are neuroendocrine tumors, where do they occur, and how do they spread, are different to the more common adenocarcinomas in four important areas. Firstly is the site of origin. These tumors arise from hormone producing cells. Hormones are chemicals that have biological action in the body removed from where they are produced. These tumors have a variant behavior pattern from being very slow in their growth and spread to highly malignant. A minority of these produce hormones as I've just explained. These are chemicals that will have a biological action in the body. And finally, some of these will have a genetic component and may run in families. Although they can occur almost anywhere, the most common sites are the lungs, the pancreas, small and large bowel, and the appendix. They can cause symptoms by two mechanisms. First is local, and the other is because of hormone products, i.e. chemicals that have a biologic action on the body. For instance, in the bowel, they could cause small bowel obstruction locally. The same may occur in large bowel, may form a large mass in the pancreas, causing pressure on the surrounding structures. And now let's look at some of the other effects due to hormone production, which only occurs in a minority of the tumors. In this slide, you can see the primary tumor location, symptoms, and what tests are required in the blood to detect these chemicals. So for the lung, there could be local action, but also due to the hormones, such as flushing and wheezing, or excess hormone production. Small bowel tumors can cause local symptoms or a condition called carcinoid syndrome, where excess hormones are produ produced, leading to flushing, diarrhea, and effects on the heart called carcinoid heart disease. And the same is true for or the colon rectum and the pancreas. How do these tumors spread? Here in this cartoon, I've drawn stomach, the small bowel, colon, and the appendix with a neuroendocrine tumor in it. These get bigger over time, and then they may spread locally through lymph channels, which are separate avenues from the blood vessels, and they enter lymph nodes, which are tiny nubbins of tissue originally with immune function, and they often trap cancer cells. That is what is shown over here of the lymph nodes which are involved and finally these tumor cells also spread through the blood and enter the bloodstream and find home in the liver forming separate deposits within the liver over time they can of course spread to other organs such as the lungs the brain and the bones it is crucial in the treatment of these tumors to obtain an early biopsy that is getting a tissue sample in this instance if the tumor has spread to the liver a needle may be inserted and tissue withdrawn because that will give the most important important information with regards to the behavior of the tumor. Now, once a biopsy has been obtained, let's look into the important factors that will determine long-term survival. One of the most important factors that impact survival and determines which treatment would be suitable for what patient. It is the grade of the tumor and the other is differentiation, but let's first talk about how we grade neuroendocrine tumors. This requires a biopsy. So in this cartoon over here, the tumor from the appendix has spread to the liver and a needle can be inserted straight into it under ultrasound guidance and a biopsy take. When that material is reviewed under the microscope by a pathologist using a high-powered field, HPF, he sees the tumor cells and what he's trying to find is those which are actively dividing. So over here and over here, these are the two that are, that are actively dividing within this higher power field. And if the total is 150 and only two are dividing, then this is a good prognosis tumor called G1. Similarly, if the percentage of cells dividing is between 2 and 20 percent that is a g2 tumor and if it's greater than 20 percent then it is a g3 with the worst prognosis and often very aggressive tumors colleges often also use a dye called the ki67 or the key 67 to stain the tumors that are dividing and use the same measure in the same way to rate the tumor the other important parameter is differentiation and it means that if the normal cells look like this the tumor cells that is most closely aligned to this in its appearance as illustrated over here which is very similar to what the original tumor looks like this is a well differentiated tumor and this corresponds with g1 and a good prognosis tumor 
The moderate one looks something like the original tumor, but not quite like it. And this is called a moderate with moderate differentiation, usually goes with the G2. And finally, poorly differentiated tumors are completely wild and have no correlation with the tissue from which it originated. And these are said to be poorly differentiated tumors corresponding to the G3 grade. Although the differentiation and the grading correspond with each other, with a G1 corresponding with well and so on, but this is not always a given. Crossover over often does happen and it means that the tumor may then have character characteristics somewhere in between such as a well differentiated tumor having a G3 grade. It is rare but it does happen. It means that perhaps in this case the prognosis is not as poor as a G3 and a poorly differentiated tumor. So the other factors that impact outcome from neuroendocrine tumors include burden of the disease. The bigger the tumor more the spread to the local lymph nodes or distant, then that is not a good sign. Spread outside of the normal confines of the tumor into the lymph nodes, towards the liver, to the lungs or bone is a poor prognostic mark. Carcinoid heart disease is a very dangerous complication for patients who suffer carcinoid syndrome. In this condition, in carcinoid heart disease, the tumor or its spread into the liver produce a large amount of chemicals enter the bloodstream. Here's a cartoon of the heart. They can enter the heart and in doing so, as they traverse the valves of the heart that prevent backflow, they end up damaging the valves. And this tends to happen on the right side of the heart. And the commonest valves that get damaged are these, as I've shown in this illustration, causing ultimately for the right side of the heart to start to fail. This is a very serious condition and patients Patients may start getting symptoms as soon as within a few months and if untreated then unfortunately this condition in, in its own right can be rapidly fatal. The usual treatment consists of valve replacement surgery. Having metastases in the liver itself is a poor prognostic marker and the larger number the worse the outcome. Patients with greater than five metastases have a poorer outcome than those with less than five. Old age at the time of diagnosis and finally tumors that secrete hormones specifically those that are difficult to control do not have as good an outcome. This culminates a brief overview of the main factors that predict outcome for neuroendocrine tumors in general. If you have any comments please do share.